morning. It is good to be here. We're still doing the letters to the churches in Revelation, and we're looking at uh, Revelation chapter 3, and I'll read verses 1 to 6. This is the fifth letter to the fifth church. And he says this, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. You will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, we just pray that you will help us to hear what you have to say to us today. In Christ's name, amen. Just uh, have a quick... Uh, preview here. This is the map that Alan used, and I thank him for that. Um, we've got yeah, there, you've got John is on the island of Patmos. I've lost it. And uh, he sent his, wrote the letters and he sent them out from Patmos. Oh, what's happening? Here we are. Oh, got him work left-handed. He sent the letters and they went over to Ephesus. Sorry, I'm working backwards. And then up to uh, Smyrna, up to Pergamon, down to Thyatira and Sardis. He's just sent the letters out. I don't believe they were sent in a particular order to fit a political, um, a prophet prophetic sequence. They were sent out just in that order as John wrote those letters. And uh, I want to come back to that soon. It, um, Sardis is about 80 kilometres northeast of Ephesus. And uh, many expositors say that the, the seven letters were a prophetic utterance. They may have been, but they, I don't think they were started out as that. And to try to put that inference on, we could be locking ourselves into a situation where uh, it wasn't a, a, the original intention. We don't want to look at these letters as ancient history. We want to look at them as a message to churches, to current churches, churches that are in existence today. They're, they are there for us today. And uh, those churches all existed at the same time. And uh, they all exist today at the same time. You've got to remember that churches are people and human nature has not changed. I prefer to take it a little bit uh, more personal these letters were uh, in existence then, they exist today, and they are for, uh, the message is for us today. If we were to ask the churches in Myanmar or Nigeria where they fitted into in that prophetic scale, they're not going to say they lost their first love. They're not going to say that, uh, that Jesus is standing at the door knocking. They're going to say, we're the persecuted church. It's alive. It's happening today. They all exist today. And so this may, these mess, letters to the churches are for each of us. And uh, they are for us today here at Karabi as well. But I would take that even a little bit further. 
It's a letter to us personally. They are for individual Christians. Any one of us could have, be at the situation where we've lost our first love or we could be persecuted or we could be compromising our faith or we could be enticed by false teachers. Any one of us, even today. So when we come to today's study, it's not, it's not just for the church but for each one of us as individuals. So I want us to examine ourselves first and then to act upon what we find. Now the fifth letter was sent to Sardis. It's interesting that the only reference to Sardis is found in Revelation chapter 1 with the introduction and chapter 3 which I've just read. And to get a handle on what John is applying we do need to know some of the history of Sardis. Now, since I can't get my history from the Bible I have to go outside and I don't like doing that too often but um, in this case we have to get our history from history and uh, so I want to first of all quote uh, as I started this study the first book I picked up was a uh, Bible dictionary and uh, I don't like its definition and uh, but I'm going to refer to it because I'm going to refer to talk about it anyway um, this is what one Bible dictionary says about Sardis. Ancient Sardis, the capital of Lydia, was a very important city. It lay about 50 miles, and that's 80 kilometres, northeast of Ephesus at the junction of five main roads. So it was a centre of trade. It was also an important military centre. The city of Sardis was built on a mountain spur, which made it a secure fortress which could only be approached from one direction. All other sides were self-protected by a sheer cliff face. History records that it was, however, captured twice. Cyrus captured it in 548 BC. And in the year 214 BC, it was captured by the army of Antiochus the Great. It is reported that both times it was captured, the guards had failed to do their job. They were asleep on the job. One of the major features there in New Testament times was a temple to Artemis the goddess of love and fertility. Sardis was also known for its manufacture of woolen garments, a fact that has a bearing on Christ's message to the church. The art of dyeing wool is said to have been invented there. I'll stop because the, that dictionary goes on for another couple of pages describing Sardis. As I said, I don't completely agree with it, but uh, I'll come back to that. Um, Let's start with the ancient history of Sardis. Sardis was the capital of Lydia. Sardis itself is not mentioned in the Bible other than in Revelations, but Lydia is. And uh, the, the Lydia comes from the word Ludums. Lydia was founded by Lud, or Lud, the son of Shem, the son of Noah. So if you trace it back to Noah, it is a very ancient history a very old established city. One scholar dates it at 1200 BC. It was probably even older. And as the Bible dictionary said, the city of Sardis was built on a mountain spur, which made a secure fortress, which could only approach from one direction. All other directions were self-protected by sheer cliffs. Reports in other documents say that these cliffs were 1500 feet high if you're on metric, that's about 450 metres. It was originally only a small family clan and they took advantage of the cliffs for a natural defence against marauders. And they soon outgrew their original area and built another city just below them, but still on the same mountain range and protected in the same way on the three sides. Now the next photo, the compliments of Joshua, Not working. That one there, I probably won't get the pointer now. Um, we've got the city itself is up on here, and this is an artist's impression, incidentally. It's not an actual photo, it's an artist's impression. The city is built on the hill up here, they said, and they have drawn the cliff face along here, but I disagree with that because I think the cliff face were along here, 
and along there. But this still gives the good impression. The city is built up there, they outgrew that area and then they built another city or extended down into the here. Um, so uh, that gives a good impression. But the, the next photo, thanks to Trevor, he had a visit over there and he gave me this photo of the um, Artemis, Artemis Temple. And uh, it's very, it was interesting to see the, uh, the pillars, there's two, still two full two pillars, the, the height of that temple, the size of it, it's quite an impressive building. But that's not what impressed me in this photo. What impressed me in this photo is you go back here to the mountain range. Those cliff faces is what protected this city down here. Those cliff faces over here are the same as what protected the cliff the city down here. So the city had three sides protected with those cliff and then the, if any army had to come, they had to come one way, straight at them. And that made it very difficult. So um, we'll just go to the next one. I've entitled my study this morning, The Dying Church. That's the end of the, well, not quite the end of the history lesson, but pretty close to it. The Bible Dictionary reported it was captured twice. That doesn't give the correct picture. It was captured twice, but they've had been attacked and uh, well, at, uh, at least five times. And uh, the first time was by Cyrus, king of Persia. And you can read about him in Daniel chapter 6 and also in 2 Chronicles 36. He was a real person and he's real in the scriptures. Cyrus captured them. And uh, we'll uh, go to the others. Um, Cyrus and his army came up to attack Sardis and they were confronted by these cliff faces. And they said, well, if we go straight at them, we're going to be wiped out. And they were watching and studying these, the uh, city to see how they could get in to attack them. And as they were watching... One of the guards on Sardis, his helmet fell off and it rolled down the cliff face. So what does he do? He climbs down. There's a little, about a path. He climbs down. He gets his helmet, puts it on and climbs back up again. Cyrus, being a pretty smart man, says, if he can get up there, so can we. And so that night they went in, captured the city, they weren't expecting anybody to come up that cliff face. They were all looking out here where the armies were. But they came up the cliff face and captured the city. And uh, then in uh, 499 BC, the Athenians uh, tried to capture Sardis, but they failed. They did inflict some damage, but they did not capture them. In 334 BC, Alexander the Great captured Sardis without a fight. They simply surrendered. I believe Alexander the Great had captured the whole area and uh, they just gave up to him. In uh, 214 BC, Antiochus the Great captured Sardis and it's reported that he captured it because the guards were asleep. Here they are, they're in their, in their fortified city thinking, well, they can't come up here, they can only come up there. But these guards who were guarding at the front line had gone to sleep. And Antiochus the Great captured it. And in 133, the Romans captured it. I'm not sorry, sure, the, so, sure of the story there, but the Romans captured it in 133. And to complete the quick history to when uh, John was writing this letter, in 17 AD, it was struck by a strong earthquake and it took years to recover. So that's a quick history. But what do we know about Sardis? Well, in fact, because it's not in the, other than in Revelation, what do we know about Lydia? The area of Lydia. They were well known for producing woolen fabrics. 
or textiles and for dyeing them. And Acts 14, this came up last week with Kevin as well, the fire tyrant woman. She was a, a, a Lydian. Um, she was converted to Christianity. Another feature of Lydians was that they invented coinage. They were rich and they, they marketed their richness with coins because apparently uh, they had them all stamped up and everything and uh, they mined the gold in a, one of the rivers that ran below them and uh, so they, they invented coins. But uh, while Sardis isn't mentioned in the Bible, Lydia is. And in uh, Isaiah 66, 19, that they, it's referred to, the Lydians were famous as archers. And again in Jeremiah 46, 9, the men of Lydia who draw the bow. So they were great warriors and they were great with the bow. They could defend their city. They could stand on those walls and defend their city and there was no problem. They were fearsome warriors. And uh, so that's about what we can, can work out about Lydia. Now if we... Um, each letter is addressed uh, to the uh, angel of the church and, and uh, they give a description of Christ. And in this letter he says, to the angel of the church inside us, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So each letter is introduced with the message to the angel of the church. Just briefly on the angel. The angel can also be interpreted as messenger. So these letters were probably going to the teacher at the various church so they could act upon these instructions. But Jesus is described in this letter as the one who holds the seven spirits of God. I have read this before and I've looked at it and, uh, and uh, had trouble working it out, but Isaiah 11.2 helps here. In Isaiah 11.2, he says, The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of power, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. When I went to school, that was six. There's seven. And I had trouble with, what is the seventh? And I used to think the seventh was the Holy Spirit. But as I was studying for today, I realised that, no, the seventh is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11 as well. For we read this in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. He says, uh, he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he ear, hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions to the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be in his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. So when John writes this letter, he's saying, the spirit of discernment was the seventh one. And that fits in it, the spirit of discernment. So what is, what does he mean by the writing to uh, the sevenfold spirit? He says, we are to use the resources we have available to us to do our job. He's saying to the, the, uh, the teacher, the, the, to the church, use the resources you've got You've got these seven uh, aspects of the Spirit of God to use them. Allow the Spirit of God to work through you, through the work through Him, with wisdom and understanding and so on. We will allow the Spirit of God to work through us. And so that's the same message for us today. We are not to uh, quench the Spirit, but we are to allow the Spirit to work through us. So what was his evaluation of the church? Each time he wrote, he did an evaluation of the church. He says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. What gives a church life? Worse still, what kills a church? 
All of the church's man-made programs can never bring life any more than a magician can resurrect a corpse. The church was born when the Spirit of God descended on the day of Pentecost and its life comes from the Spirit. When the Spirit is grieved, the church begins to lose life and power. When sin is confessed, the church members get right with God and each other. Then the Spirit breathes new life. We can have a revival. In this letter, there are no words of commendation. They're not praised for anything. Nor did the Lord point out any doctrinal problems that required correction. Neither is there any mention of opposition or persecution. The church would have been better had it been suffering, for it had grown very comfortable and it was living on its past reputation. Like the city itself, the church at Sardis glorified in its past efforts, but it ignored the present day decay. God said, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. The message to Sardis is a warning to all great churches that are living on past glory. Dr. Vance Havner has reminded us that spiritual ministries often go in, through four stages. First the man, then a movement, then a machine, and then a monument. And he says Sardis was at the monument stage. But there was hope. There are churches today who have had a great testimony and ministry in the past but they seem to rely on the past successes they have become complacent we as individual believers can also be caught up in this trap we dwell on the fact that we have done great things for the Lord in the past and we rest on our laurels we are complacent we're asleep we're in danger of being overrun by Satan or as he says, we are dying. One reason for this is that we are given gifts from God. We're given gifts. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. When we neglect to use our gifts to serve God, and the church, surely we are letting the church down. We are letting God down. I heard of one man who refused to fill in a form to acknowledge his gift or gifts after the church had been given some teaching on the spiritual gifts. Why did he refuse to do that? He would be given something else to do. That sort of attitude can only lead to the death of a church. Kevin last week was telling us about the guilds or uni unions of the day, the silversmiths and the goldsmiths and so on. Yeah, unions were active then. We have unions today. They go on strike. They withhold their labour for one purpose, to make the company suffer so that they can get whatever they're going on strike for. When we as Christians, if we withhold our labour, if we go on strike, we, call, we can cripple the church. We can pull it down. We can destroy it. We can kill it. Let's use our gifts wisely. It's our responsibility to be responsible when it comes to using our gifts. It's when we become negligent in our ministry that the enemy finds his way in. Another way is if we neglect to study God's word. We leave ourselves open to the attacks of Satan. We become too busy to take time to read God's word. When work takes over our Christ Christian life, when study takes over our Christian life, or simply going out and having a good time and being entertained becomes more important than studying God's word. And we are pulling the church down because we're on that downhill slide 
And the same comes with prayer. When we don't find time to pray, we're not praying for each other, we're not praying for the church. Remember, the seven days without prayer makes one week. And if we go without prayer, we become weak. We can pull the church down. We need to be praying for our teachers, praying for our ministries, praying for the persecuted church, praying for our political leaders. But most of all, we need to be praying. Then he gives this advice to the church. Very simple advice. Wake up! So if you're going to sleep, wake up! That's the uh, NIV version. The other version says, be watchful. This is something the readers would have all known about. They would have been aware. Sardis had been attacked and defeated twice because the guards were asleep. He says, wake up! We're in danger of being attacked. We're in danger of being overtaken. So he says, wake up. Don't allow that attitude to take part in our life. The first step towards renewal in a dying church is an honest awareness that something is wrong. When an organism is alive, there's growth, there's reproduction, there's power. And if these elements are lacking in a church, then that church is either dying or is already dead. That goes for our own lives. The impression is that the church in Sardis was not aggressive in its witness. To, there was no persecution because they were not threatening Satan's territory at all. The unsaved in Sardis saw the church as a respectable group of people who presented no problem to them. They were decent, respectable people, but they had no witness in the community. They were just good people. He says, wake up. That's not how it should be. We should be working in the community. Our witness should be there. And then he goes on, he expresses it even stronger. He says, wake up, be watchful and repent. Remember the word you have received and obey it. This is the formula for revival. It's good to guard our spiritual heritage, but we don't embalm it. It's not enough to be true to the faith and have a great history. The faith must produce life and works. Jesus is coming very soon. He's coming to take his bride, the church, home. How we need to be all the more ready and active to proclaim the good news of the gospel. How we need to be witness for him. David Jeremiah says that there are no signs for Christ's return to be fulfilled. He could come at any time. And he is coming soon. Are we ready? Are we serving God as though we believe that Jesus is coming soon? Then John goes on, strengthen what remains and is about to die. They were dying, but they were not dead. God said, strengthen what remains. There's still something there. There was some life. There was weak, but there was life. And he says, God wanted that to come to life, to get back into action. There was hope because Christ was the head of the church and he was able to bring new life. The Holy Spirit gives life to the church and life is exactly what the people of Sardis needed. There was a remnant though, a remnant of dedicated people and this often exists even in a dying church. The Christians at Sardis had life even though it was weak. They were working even though their works were not all that they should have been, the Lord admonished them to strengthen what remained and not give up. He calls the church to action. Where there is life, there is hope. When Ahab 
and Jezebel were challenging Elijah and the worship of Baal. Elijah thought he was all alone. And God said, no, there are 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God kept a faithful remnant. Even in a dying church, God keeps a faithful remnant. The warning here is that we do not grow comfortable in our churches, lest we find ourselves slowly dying. The encouragement is that no church is beyond hope as long as there is a remnant in it willing to strengthen the things that remain. The Lord warned the Ephesian church that he'd come and remove the lampstand if they did not repent. He warned the church at Pergamos that he would come and make war with the sword of the Spirit. If the believers at Sardis did not follow his orders, he would come as a thief. When they least expected him, and this would mean judgment. Yet you have a few in Sardis, he goes on, who have not soiled their clothes. We must remember that God is watching and he cares for each one of us. He knows us by name. He knows our actions. John 10, 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And uh, I think I should be on the next. In John 10, uh, and 1 Corinthians 8 3, he says, The man who loves God is known by God. And 2 Timothy 2 19, he says, The Lord knows those who are his. The Lord knows us, he knows our hearts, he looks at us. We don't have to judge anybody else. I'm glad I don't have to judge anybody else, but the Lord looks at us, each one. We, each one of us is responsible for our actions, for our words, for what we do but there was a remnant. They had not defiled their garments. They had not compromised their faith. There's some evidence that the uh, worship in the temples and probably in the temple of Artemis as well, that no one could enter there if they had dirty garments. They had to have clean garments. So they would have known that and it would have been a sign for them that they're that their garments were soiled. They had no access to God. But um, also, we're reminded that they made woolen products and they dyed wool. I'm not, not much of an expert on dyeing wool or, or material, but I can imagine that if you had a dirty spot on something, it would not dye very well. The material around it would dye, but not that area. And this is really the inference here. They, they saw it, their garments were soiled, they were marred. Sin had marred their lives and they had compromised with the world and they'd grown comfortable, they'd grown lazy. So it is this devoted spiritual remnant that held the future of the church ministry. Sin defiles us so that we cannot approach God. What a challenge for us today. It's not enough to be doctrinally correct. We must be spiritually active. It's not enough to know God's word. We must do it. Righteousness is not a shroud, but working clothes. If you or I should find ourselves in a dead church, let's remember that even in Sardis there were saints dressed in white. The symbol not only of purity, but of overcoming. In 2 Peter 3.14 we read, So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, now that this here is the new heaven and new earth, it says, Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. We're looking forward to Christ's return. We need to be making every effort to live a worthy life. We should be the salt and the light of the world around us. He says there that they will walk with God. They are working in a, an elite group of men. Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. Moses talked with God face to face. David was a man after God's own heart. All these men were faithful, were obedient to God. 
and they were dressed in white. They do not compromise. The one who is victorious will be dressed in white. The one who is victorious, he's the overcomer. And the overcomer is dressed in white. They are clothed in garments of salvation. They are washed in the blood of the Lamb. But most importantly, their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And Jesus told his disciples to rejoice in the fact that their names were recorded in heaven, Luke 10, 20. These overcomers were recorded in the Lamb's book of life. When God records our names in the book, it remains there. The fact that their names were not blotted out was very significant to those living in Sardis. Sardis was a Roman outpost and those born in Sardis had Roman citizenship and there were consequences that if they lost their citizenship, Roman citizenship, they lost a lot of privileges. So they knew that it was something to be guarded but their names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They were secure. Their citizenship was in heaven. He says, Jesus said that he would acknowledge us before God and our fa- God our Father. Jesus would bear witness to the fact that we have accepted him as our Lord and Saviour. That we come into God's presence not with our righteousness of our own, but with the righteousness of Jesus our Saviour. And he signs off his letter with this. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Has the Spirit been talking to you today? Have you been listening? More to the point. Have you heeded his call? You know, unfortunately I have to wear hearing aids. It's not good. Because without them, the most, a lot of sounds are quite blurry. I put a hearing aid in and it will sharpen some of those sounds up so I can hear better. But if the battery dies, these ear, hearing aids become ear plugs. They block out the sound. If I get a bit of wax in my ear behind that hearing aid, it blocks out the sound. I can't hear what is being said. We have to unblock. Take those earplugs out and listen to what God is saying. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. We need to be hearing what God is saying to us today. And uh, just very quickly, one more slide there. Michael Yusuf on TV on Sunday mornings is aiming to reach millions of people and he's got a program called Awake Australia. I go one further. Let's wake up, Carlby. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us today. Help us to hear what you are saying to us. Lord, that we'll take out these blocks in our ears, the earplugs. And Lord, that we will not stop them up, but we will listen to what you are saying to us. And Lord, that we'll apply it and put it into action. We ask that in Christ's name. Amen.